Howdy and welcome to the 10 week Bible study. This is a special series that we're doing leading up to Christmas on the messianic prophecies found in the old Testament. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs. And today we're going to be talking about how Jesus was pierced for our transgressions from Isaiah 52 and 53. It's the Bible verse they don't want you to know about. Actually, they don't want you to know about it. That's that's why it hasn't been read in synagogues in hundreds of years. I, I know that's kind of clickbaity, but it's it's actually true. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified when new episodes are uploaded. This is a five day a week Bible study to encourage you in your walk with God. I'm really excited that you're here with me today and I can't wait to jump in to God's word. Before we do that, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to hear what your word has to say to us today, God. Speak to us, touch us, and fill us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. With that, let's go ahead and jump into God's word. We'll be reading today from the NIV. This is Isaiah chapter 52, starting in verse 13. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. So right off the bat, this is very clearly a passage about the Messiah. We're not going to go into all the details as to, to why, but this is very commonly understood as a passage about the Messiah. And just like the clickbaity title and intro, the rabbis for hundreds of years thought of this as a passage about the Messiah. The biggest problem with that is the Messiah is not supposed to be one that's appalling or disfigured or rejected. He's supposed to be highly exalted. I and mean, this starts out great. He was will act wisely and he'll be lifted up and highly exalted. And then it takes a really sharp detour from there. And he's going to be marred. Uh, the kings will shut their mouths because of all these things. They're not the king of kings and lord of lords that the rabbis were looking for. In fact, what it starts to look like is proof that Jesus was the Messiah, something that they couldn't have. So what's interesting and crazy about this is that this is one of the most important messianic prophecies in scripture, but Jewish rabbis will never ever read this passage in the synagogue. In fact, it was officially taken out of the synagogue reading schedule hundreds of years ago because of this, because they don't like the idea that the Messiah would be broken, that he would be disfigured, that you know people are going to reject him, that they would be appalled by him. It didn't fit the narrative, the very uh, singular narrative that they wanted to believe. Now, the issue for us is most of the messianic prophecies in the Bible point to a ruling and reigning and strong and powerful Messiah, one who's king and ruler and general, and, and he's this awesome guy, like all of the Marvel superhero movies roll into one, that's the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. And that is most of the messianic prophecies in the Bible sound like that. This one doesn't. We've already looked at Daniel chapter nine. It doesn't sound like that. These are two of the very few passages in scripture that sound like this but they're very clear. And so most Jewish people aren't even familiar that this passage exists. I've seen uh, videos and studies and things like that where people would say, you know, if you ask a Jewish person, if you read this to them and ask them where it's from, they'll tell you it's from the New Testament because it obviously is going to sound like a description of Jesus. They're not read this in the synagogues because it sounds like Jesus, and it doesn't fit that narrative of the conquering king and all that kind of stuff. Jesus is going to be a conquering king. He is the conquering king. Everything that Jews believe about the Messiah is true. There are just things that they have 
erased from their understanding about the Messiah. And it's things like this passage. Let's continue reading on in chapter 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. This is painful to read if you're expecting a Messiah to be the guy that everyone likes and ruling and conquering. This does sound like Jesus. He came and he was rejected. And why was he rejected? Because he didn't accept the teaching of man. We've looked at the book of John in our podcast, in the video series. And and if you want to check those out, they're in the, have links in the description. But we looked at how Jesus did not accept any man's teaching or any man's admonition of him. He didn't need it. He was sent by God. And so he rejected the people that were supposed to be keeping the fort down, so to speak. The religious leaders, they were supposed to be the teachers of the people of Israel when Jesus came. And he rejected them because they were mostly greedy and self-centered and self-serving. They weren't actually trying to lead his people closer to God. They were using the people for their own benefit. And we see that in, in how they applied the law and just so many other things. So Jesus rejected them. And so in turn, they rejected him. And because the leaders of Israel rejected Jesus, he's rejected to this day. That's why they won't read this passage. They're terrified that this will allow Jewish people to say, oh my gosh, maybe Jesus was the Messiah. If this was predicted, if Isaiah spoke this of him hundreds of years in advance, maybe it was Jesus. Uh, I mean, like we read in chapter 52 just a second ago, he was marred and disfigured is what happened on the cross. They shoved a crown of thorns on his head and it, it just ruined him. I mean, he was physically destroyed by the cross and what led up to the cross. He was tortured so much more than most people who had to endure suffering on a cross in the Roman world. I mean, they whipped him to an inch just shy of his life. They put that crown of thorns on him. I mean, they spit on him. They beat him before he went to the cross. That would have been enough for most people to endure. Let's continue on. Verse 4. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So here, Isaiah is prophesying that the Messiah is going to be that sacrificial lamb. That lamb that takes away the sin of the earth, the one that was sacrificed once a year in the temple. Isaiah is prophesying that the Messiah is going to come and he is actually going to be the one who takes away our sin. Well, according to the Old Testament, the only way for that to happen is by blood. We've already seen that Jesus that he's going to sprinkle the nations. The blood of that lamb was sprinkled on the altar. All of this imagery Isaiah is placing upon the Messiah, the one to come. The only thing that he doesn't give to us about Jesus is his name. Nothing could be more clear that this is pointing to Jesus. Continue on, verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. We see that in all of the trials. Jesus doesn't speak in his own defense. Who does that? As you're being led away to death, who doesn't stand up and say, wait a second, I'd like to, I'd like to throw something in here before you kill me. Let me make sure that you understand that I, I don't deserve this. 
Who does that? Who doesn't speak up for themselves? It's because he knew who he was and he knew what his purpose was. He wasn't killed. He laid his life down. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had no, done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. The prophet Isaiah here is proclaiming that he would be perfect. There's not a human being that has not done violence. There is not a human being that doesn't lie or hasn't lie, lied at some point in their life. And he's saying there's no violence in him and he's not ever lied. That's not true of anyone on planet earth ever except for Jesus. And it's because he is this Messiah to come. He is the one who could stretch out his hands in innocent and be sacrificed for our sake. Verse 10, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And he and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So here, very clearly, Isaiah is saying that the Messiah would die. But then he would be raised to life. The Lord is going to crush him, yet he's going to prolong his days. He's going to be buried with the wicked and the rich, but he's going to be raised to life. He's going to have a portion. I mean, all of these things are so contradictory. It's a paradox that, you know, the Messiah is going to come and he's going to die, but he's going to have everything, but he's going to have nothing. How does all of this work? The Messiah was going to be around twice. He was going to come. He was going to be rejected and despised and afflicted. He was going to be known as a man of sorrows. And what this means here, and this is what is so powerful. Jesus has borne our pain and our grief. He has known our sorrow. Sorrow doesn't come from just bad things happening. You, you aren't sorrowful because your car died or you got in a wreck or something like that. Sorrow comes from rejection. We've all known rejection, but Jesus has known it too. Imagine coming to the people that you created and having them reject you. Jesus knew that. Isaiah prophesied that he would be a man of sorrows, rejected, and that he would be pierced for our transgressions. It was for our sin, Isaiah's people's sin. Isaiah's looking at this from a, a Jewish-centric perspective that it was for his people's sin, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, that the Messiah would be crushed by God, that he would die. We understand from the Gospels and from Acts that that is extended, and from prophets like Hosea, that that's extended to us as Gentiles. If you're like me, if you're a Gentile, then that bruising, that piercing for our transgressions, that applies to me as well, and you as well. All of these things Isaiah prophesied hundreds of years in advance of Jesus coming. We celebrate Jesus at Christmas as a baby, but the truth about his first advent, which is what Christmas time is about, is that we're celebrating the fact that God became a man and that he was going to do all of these things that were prophesied in Isaiah, that he came not as a baby so that we could have Christmas presents and things like that. He came as a baby so that he could be a human, so that he could die in our place 
and that the burden of our peace, the punishment that would bring us peace was upon him. The justification of our sin was taken by him and him alone. Jesus came and he was born of a virgin and he was born a baby that we celebrate at Christmas. And the three kings came and they brought the gifts and we celebrate that today. But most importantly, more important than everything else we celebrate at Christmas, he came. He came. God with us. Emmanuel was his name. God with us. He came to be one of us so that he could bear the burden of our sin, that he could heal all our diseases, that forever and forever we can be with God, we can fellowship with God because he came to be one of us. That's what we celebrate at Christmas time. And that's why these Old Testament prophecies are so important that we, we know them, we understand them because they make all of the difference. If Jesus just came and proclaimed that he was God, it might be true, but we have the testimony of scripture written hundreds of years and even thousands of years in advance that he was going to come and he came just like it was prophesied of him. And he wasn't just going to come once and rule and conquer the earth. He came the first time to make atonement for our sin so that we could live with him forever, that we could be in his presence, that we could be made right with God so that we could be with him. He justified us and he makes intercession for us that we can stand before God with confidence even though we don't deserve it. He's paid that paid for that privilege for us. I pray that this Christmas season, you will marvel in the glory that God has given us and, and just dwell on the gift that he has given us. Not just the gifts that we give each other, but the gift that he has given us. Thanks for joining me on the 10-week Bible study today. If you'd like to support what we're doing here, I encourage you to check out the 10-week Bible study on Patreon. You can donate any amount you want to. If you don't want to, that's fine. I, I appreciate everyone who, who supports this work or who likes or comments or subscribes and shares this with other people. My heart is to see people's hearts and lives come alive with love for God's word because I know if, if you can fall in love with God's word, you'll fall in love with him too. That's my heart. And I hope this Christmas season, you will fall more in love with his word and more in love with him. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, for the 10-week Bible study, and I'll see you next time.